Welcome everybody, for those of you who are awake. Uh, welcome to the first day of Ceramics Expo 2021. And I must say for myself, and I'm sure for many of you, we're really happy to be here live as opposed to online. It's good that things are happening, allowing us to do this again. So please, a, a, a few process announcements. Please make sure your mobile phones are in silent mode. Uh, video flash photography is prohibited. Conference proceedings and recordings uh, will have authorization to be shared that will be made available uh, seven to 10 days after the close of the event. Just a reminder, like we've done in previous years, we're using the software app called Slido. Uh, it's a dedicated Slido session. Slido is an interactive tool allowing you to put questions to the panel anonymously through a free website. Please log on to www.slido.com on your phone and enter the event code pound CEX 21, where you can scan the OR code that's on the agenda and the show guide. Thank you uh, for attending. So our first session today is on sustainability and innovation. The topic is reimagining the supply chain, lessons for efficiency in the wake of the COVID pandemic. I'd like to start first by introducing myself and the panelists. My name is Mark Wolf. I'm the vice president of Kyocera International Fine Ceramics Group, also an officer. Kyocera is a very diversified global company, and in the United States, we have multiple plants focused on oxides and non-oxides for a variety of industrial businesses. If my panelists could please introduce themselves. Good morning. Can you hear me? You're not on. Is the mic on? Yeah, you can. Perfect, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chris Duchesne. Uh, I lead the uh, supply chain organization for Course Tech. Uh, Course Tech is a highly engineered ceramics manufacturing company based out of Golden, Golden Colorado. And I've been with the organization for four years. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hello? Say it again. Good morning. Ah, good morning. My name is Tom Scari. I am the Senior Vice President of Bastic International. Uh, we're headquartered in New Jersey. We're a specialty performance additive supplier uh, with four offices worldwide. Uh, I've been with Bastec uh, a little over 14 years. And All right, next mic. And I'm Landon Mertz. I'm the CEO of Sirion Nanomaterials. Uh, we're one of the largest here in the United States for designing, scaling, and manufacturing nanoparticles. Uh, specifically metal, metal oxide, and ceramics. Most of our customers tend to be uh, companies that are developing products, moving them to commercialization, uh, leveraging nanomaterials either as part of the broad product set or as a subcomponent. Excellent. Th thank you, gentlemen. So let's get right into the topic. We are certainly all have been dealing with COVID-19 for the last year and a half. Uh, unfortunately, the new Delta variant is making things difficult again. Um, I'd love to hear how the COVID-19 pandemic um, has changed or shaped the way you work with, you, work with your supply chain to ensure cont continuity of supply for both you and your customers. We, we can just go down the line if you like. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I, I'll start. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think a lot of it in the initial part of COVID or the pandemic uh, moved from more strategic to tactical, right? So we, early on in the pandemic, we focused more on tactical issues that came fast and furious, right? But I think in the long term, uh, things that we're expecting from our suppliers now is the new expectations is around inventory management and better forecasting between us and them and with their supply chain. As we've seen, you know, as everybody has seen multiple issues that's trickled around the management of inventory and forecasting the ability to get us materials when we need it. As we move from 2020 into 2021, just the velocity of the demand that has grown uh, and the ability for us and our suppliers to keep up with that pace, coupled with all the supply chain issues around labor, material shortages. So that tightness and collaboration is needed much more than ever before, right? And the pandemic has drawn that out. Tom? S similar to Chris said, you know, we, we kind of uh, focused on our suppliers, looked at our inventory management. Um, we were really trying to kind of build an open communication with our customers, kind of giving them uh, really insight to our shipping, our, our inventories, our, um, for the full gamut, more than we were ever before. We were on uh, daily calls with our teams. We were on weekly calls with customers, bi-monthly calls just to keep everyone up to date on uh, how, to, how to keep uh, everyone up ahead of the curve uh, for the supply. 
And as 2019, uh, sorry, 2020 was very um, different than 2021, all the uh, say issues started coming faster to us uh, in this year. Um, and then we were, with that open communication, we were working with everyone, kind of helped us uh, bridge the curve a little bit. On our end, uh, we spent, just like you guys, uh, quite, a, uh, quite a bit of time dealing with forecasting, mm -hmm. uh, both with the customer and then back uh, to the vendor. One thing that we did is we started accrediting new raw material suppliers as fast as we could. We have many different SKUs that service many different customers, and so to the extent that we could get more supplier optionality, uh, that was a big push for us. And uh, of course, like everybody else, we surged our inventory holdings, but we did it right at the beginning in, uh, in February, which really bought us the runway to get a solid plan after the initial shock of the pandemic. You know, uh, so many of us, I know you guys are saying count on uh, supply chain out of Asia. Uh, and like we were discussing before this, the cost of logistics has gone enormous. Uh, in our case, you know, we had to, um, uh, place orders earlier in advance to try to make sure that we could use the lowest cost option, shipping option, to get supplies. Were, were you guys doing similar things to that? Or? Yeah, I would say yes. I, I think, uh, you know, what was interesting from 2020 to 2021, you know, the move, I think, holistically across the globe, you know, in 2020, a lot of organizations kind of bled down their inventories, preserved cash, and tried to keep our employees safe was kind of core to what we were working on. And then bleeding down some of the inventory and then heading into 2021 with the global demand spike, I think the ability to actually get out in front of it and try and beat the freight issues is very difficult because of the heavy demand. And in that heavy demand, there's you could break it down into two or three components, right? True spikes in demand. And then there's inventory rebuild. And then there's a buffer of inventory that even our customers are building to. Yeah. And that's not... Mm -hmm fully true demand and everybody's doing that across the supply chain which is really stretching the freight issues across the globe but trying to stay out in front of it and connect with your customers to truly truly understand what their demand is what's real versus what is that buffer and actually work that out of the supply chain right. and see if they can actually come to some consensus to bake it down and boil it down to their real demand yeah i know i know for us we tried to do uh shipping hedging um, to try and just reduce some of the financial burden. We, I, I've used hedging in, in multiple industries in, uh, in prior lives uh, very effectively, but we could not get our heads around it fast enough for it to be effective. But it is definitely on our strategic roadmap moving forward. Yeah, right. we, we were always like trying to get, uh, like I said, like Chris said, get ahead of everything. Uh, I still remember this funny story where uh, we were uh, going up the increase in Q4 of last year and then Q1 of uh, this year, uh, I actually paid like thirteen thousand dollars, I think, for a container, and it, I was congratulated by ba <laughs> by my colleagues saying, you know, it's the most expensive <laughs> container Bastic has ever paid for. Now I wish it was thirteen thousand dollars. Yeah. You know, now we're paying I don't know two, three times as much for containers. Yeah, that's crazy. All right, thank you, gentlemen. So I, I want to change topics a little bit. Um, I know all the companies here have had to deal with. COVID in some way, I think they'd be interested in, you know, what you're comfortable sharing, which ideas were successful, which ideas weren't successful and didn't work. I could take that. So uh, for us, the things that we found the most successful was definitely communication, 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 which I think any good management team, you knew you had to do that with your customer, with your vendors, with, uh, with your team members. That paid dividends for us uh, in the early days. I think the rigor in the process that we used um, was helpful, and we continue to now use that uh, to this day. Uh, another thing that we did uh, before the pandemic started, but when we were aware that there was a risk, is we sat down and we started doing tabletop crisis management uh, planning, really trying to figure out in a shutdown scenario, what would we need to do so that we don't have to think when it's time to act. And that really put us in a great situation where uh, when New York State shut down where our manufacturing is, uh, we were successful in closing down, taking five days uh, off, resetting with our most stringent uh, safety and operational plan, and then starting back up. 
so those were the, the, the two really big uh, takeaways. The other was, uh, because we were kind of early on the curve, we normally will hold like 75 days of inventory on hand. We surged at 150, and we did that by first draining as much U.S. supply as we could possibly get our hands on uh, for our near-term needs, and then uh, looking internationally for our mid-term needs. And that bought us, again, you know, that, that buffer in the beginning to really figure out a longer-term strategy to operate through the rest of the pandemic. We actually did a similar thing. We, we worked also on uh, looking at a lot of our tier one suppliers. Um, we spent most of when the initial effects of COVID came in, looked at who are most vulnerable suppliers, um, who are key uh, relationships that we had to work on, and try to uh, geographically uh, diversify our supply chain, um, and made an active effort of that, uh, which is now helping us pay off for uh, this year when certain plants have to shut down, or like I said, logistics gets uh, out of hand. We can move around to different countries and get supply. Yeah, I would, I would add, you know, we, uh, if I break down the pandemic into two components, right? You have 2020, which is completely different yeah. versus 2021. So early in 2020, we focused a lot on communication, communication, mm -hmm. communication, right? And it was really centered around keeping our factories operating. So daily trackers, daily communications internally and externally. So I think that worked well and it carried on into this year, right? Since the pandemic is still, uh, still rolling. I think, uh, at the back end of last year into this year, doing some inventory analytics, right, on runouts and safety stocks and what are those right. high runners and high risk areas were important. I think the the thing that didn't quite work that well was the low runners still had high risk areas that were just event based. So the example in was it March or April when uh, when it froze down in Texas, you know, the ripple effects on that and the low runners mm -hmm. was unknown and unplanned, mm, yeah. right? And had a huge impact on, uh, I would say, the entire supply chain and still trying to work its way out of the, uh, out of the system. I think the other piece that uh, in this year, in 2021, is working on the commercial side from a supply chain perspective with commercial on helping them reset expectations on meeting their demand and understanding manufacturing lead time, not only for us, but in our supply chain, the impacts of grown lead time in days as well as the freight issues and extended lead times that are now 2x in the transit times, as well as you know 5 to 10x in cost, right? So those things kind of work well and didn't work well, I think, but it all boils down to how we communicate both with our supply chain, with our, with our commercial teams as well. Yeah, I don't think I've met a customer yet who likes ceramic supply chain or cycle times. <laughs> yeah. So uh, have, have you guys, you know, with, uh, with all the issues, like you said, have you changed your corporate strategies regarding how much supply comes out of Asia or moving factories around to Europe? Or, you know, I have a secret hope that more stuff's gonna come back to the United States, and I think we're starting to see it. You guys comment on that? I, I, I can start, but uh, I think fundamentally, it's not necessarily reach, you know, bringing it back to the US. I think from a core tech perspective is our strategies and our new expectations to our supply chain and our supply partners is really understanding who's heck actually helped us throughout the pandemic, who stepped up to the plate that are strategic suppliers to us and who has not, and try and us reset those expectations with those suppliers to help us de-risk our organization mm -hmm. and trying to find those alternate sources um, to help us in that de-risking, right? I think is, is core to us. So that strategy and that evolution for course tech to actually go down this cart path to, to do different things and set new expectations of, of our supply base is there right and also working with them to enhance inventory strategies where we don't have to carry the full burden uh, with with what's happening in the marketplace today and kind of spread that amongst our suppliers as well uh, a little difference uh, work for uh, Bastic, we actually take on the supply uh, inventory more for, than our suppliers. So we took the uh, chance to kind of try to increase our inventory wherever possible. Um, but we were looking at, um, again, still working on supplier diversification, but we were also working with a lot of suppliers that we worked through in 2020 when you're looking at different projects. Um, and it's not keeping like an adversarial, but like more of a, let's keep everyone running. 
kind of situation. And as things were working on 2020, in 2021, those uh, relationships kind of paid off for us where we're buying material from Europe, buying material from the US, and able to keep a lot of our plants, especially like in uh, the refractory industry, keeping them running and uh, servicing their customers. Yeah, for, from our end, I think our, our supplier base is pretty diverse. Usually our uh, lower volume production materials uh, we source domestically, very high volume we'll get from, from overseas. I don't believe that our mix really has changed all that much pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic. We certainly have qualified a lot more um, raw material suppliers than we ever have in, in the history of the company. Uh, the one thing that I, I'm su suspect on going forward is just how long can the U.S. industrial base, especially for raw materials and feedstocks, hold on? Because every year we lose just a little bit of competitiveness. And in any given uh, cycle, that's okay. But when you compound that over 10, 15, 20 years, it's actually pretty meaningful. Uh, the other thing that I worry about uh, just for the industrial base in the U.S., especially you know, kind of down the chain, is uh, uh, global utilization. So the global utilization rate for manufacturing capacity across all sectors is 65% incredibly low, which means that you have lower cost markets that have a need and a desire to compete because they've got this excess bandwidth. So it'll be interesting to see how those dynamics play out 15 to 20 years. But from, uh, from my perspective, I don't think our, our mix has changed that much domestic to international. Yeah, so uh, many of us are, are pretty diversified. We support a lot of markets. You know, it'd be nice for all of our markets to be doing great. Unfortunately, it's not the case. We have some markets that are good, some markets are not. But I think overall, it appears that the industry is growing, certainly over last year. You know, one of the uh, issues that I hear every place I go is I can't find anybody to hire. <laughs> you know, either workers or engineers, the industry is really hurting from not finding enough people. You know, maybe you guys can give comment on how you're addressing that issue. What are you kind of doing to, to take care of that? I can, I can give you uh, <laughs> what we've been doing. I mean, we've been getting a lot more active with um, uh, specific universities and trying to really insert ourselves into the process. We have gotten involved at the federal level uh, around STEM and STEM in, uh, in nanomaterials specifically. It is a long-term concern for us. Like, for example, we used to be able to hire just out of the local Rochester market because of some of the lineage of Kodak, which is based there. Now, I mean, we're, we're recruiting people in from Texas, from California, and it's getting harder and harder every year. Um, I don't know that Sirion alone has the magic bullet, but there's definitely uh, a need to address it long term, I'd say over the next 10 years or so. We, uh, we kind of took a, a longer approach also. Um, we actually took people from university who have no idea about ceramics, no idea about refractories, and we'd start teaching them. Uh, it's a longer curve, um, but that's like exactly kind of how I started with Bastec. I had no idea about this industry. Uh, 14 years later, I'm here standing in front, sitting in front of you guys. So just going from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very similar, but I think it's, uh, you know, our credit to our HR group, they've, they've been really creative in local markets to try and draw people from different markets and industries into our business. I'm, and I'm talking more at the factory level, you know, trying to meet our demand of our customers and have our HR folks be really mm -hmm. creative. I think in that creativeness, we're also have to uh, put uh, pay increases out there as well. And that's something that we're never going to get back. So in the marketplace, we have to adjust salaries to compete, sign on bonuses, things of that nature, draw from other areas that we've never thought of before. And so those things are really impacting the business, I would say in a negative way, because of the labor shortage. Yeah, yeah for right? sure. We've definitely seen competition for labor like we have not seen in the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, I would say that you know, new, uh, mean cost for new hires is probably five, 6% higher than it was previously. So it's, pre it's pretty fierce out there. Yeah. For sure it is. Uh, just as a reminder to the audience, we really haven't gotten any questions on Slido yet. So if there's something that you'd really like to ask, please send it to us. We'll try to address everything. So uh, um, back to the personnel thing. I agree with you. Um, we're also seeing tremendous competition and you know, kind of crazy things. People throwing around. You know, I think I read that 40% of all people under the age of 40 are currently looking for another job, <laughs> which is an incredible number. 
Uh, one of the issues that we've been really struggling with, and maybe you guys want to comment on, is um, changes in the office environment that you addressed. You know, a lot of us learned during the pandemic, you know, work from home maybe works, work remotely kind of works, more Teams or Zoom meetings kind of stuff. You know, we're at the point where we're seeing not only were we able to handle it, but employees want it. You know, employees are saying, what can you do to increase the flexibility in, in what I do? You guys seen those issues? How are you addressing those? Absolutely, we've seen those issues. <laughs> I, think the, uh, I think the challenge is, you know, we want to make sure, you look in 2020 and then the carryover of the pandemic into 2021, we, you know, we look at how productive we were and what our expectations are of our team members and mainly the white collar team members that are in the office. Our blue collar folks you know, have to go to work in the factories. And I think from a course tech perspective, we still like that face-to-face -face collaboration. And so we're trying to balance that again with the you know, work at home stay orders that took place in 2020. But then coming out of that, we want people to come back. Um, but we're still <laughs> trying to be flexible and with the new attitudes and, and new changes of maybe the 40 something and un younger, um, trying to meet those, uh, those expectations and be flexible. It's, it's, it's an interesting time. And I think our leadership team is coming around to look at new ways uh, to operate, but we haven't bridged that gap yet. Yeah, I can, I can tell you from, from our end, there's a, actually a fantastic study that was done by Microsoft looking at um, work from home and you know, benefits and, and detractors. And what they found was that uh, mean task time increased pretty dramatically, but all of the factors that they would measure for innovation connectivity actually went down pretty dramatically. And uh, it, we're 15 years old, so we're young, relatively speaking. Uh, you know, we really do believe that you, you lose that collaborative spirit, the innovative spirit, especially amongst, uh, you know, our management team. Uh, we made it work for the last year and a half or so, but we are bringing back um, our office teams. I think the one caveat is we're now taking more of a, a soft approach of maximum flexibility. So if somebody wants to work from Florida for two weeks, if we know that they really are working, then it's not really a problem uh, to us. Whereas before, maybe we would have not looked favorably on it. Uh, but for the most part, everybody's coming back in. And then, of course, our R&D operation and our manufacturing operation continues steady as she goes. Our leadership team uh, brought most of our staff back in. We're more of a hybrid schedule, but we've actually offered a lot more flexibility. Um, it's another way also to keep talent um, in the organization. Um, and stuff that were basically, if you needed to work from home on a Thursday, you know, you're working. As long as you're, like said, uh, as long as it's working, um, it's fine. So. so we have an interesting question here I'm going to send to the audience. It says, um, is your company experiencing young engineer turnover? And if so, how is your company addressing that? It's the opposite for us. We're losing older engineers as they're retiring out. Um, and we just, generally speaking, the demographic is now starting to skew younger. But we haven't really seen uh, tremendous turnover there. I don't have engineers, so. <laughs> that could only, from hearsay, across our organization. But I don't think it's necessarily young engineer turnover. I think it's just finding engineers in the space to actually attract and bring into the organization is a challenge. I think it just couples with the overall labor shortage across any function. And I think it applies to engineering, and it's difficult. Right. You know, I would say for Kiyosera, you know, I wouldn't just focus on engineers. We are seeing a a younger person turnover. People who have been with the company less. I mean, they have less holding them there. You know, things like a pension matter to them less. Um, and they like the idea of, you know, living anywhere, maybe more flexibly. We're, we're like yourselves. We like collaboration. We like people coming into the plant. We brought people back, especially in production, of course. Uh, and some people got really comfortable with not doing that. And so they are sometimes able to find those positions. So we're struggling with that also. What is, what is the right answer? And I think the younger people are more likely to move. The people who have been doing this a long time, they kind of like the old way too, and they're not looking to change that. So we're kind of seeing that. Are there any particular skill sets you guys are looking for? Any messages we could send out to the group about what kinds of engineers we're looking for, what kinds of practices or experiences they got to have? 
The only thing I can say is, so we, we, uh, we specialize in multiple synthesis methods for making nanomaterials. Uh, so, you know, precipitation, hydrosolvothermal, we do high temperature processes. We find when we move into the ceramic space and need to do recruiting, it's two times harder than any other role we fill. Um, I'm not exactly sure the, the type of engineers that we're looking for. I do know that they're more development focused, scale up focused, because we have a lot in our pipe that's moving through. So, you know, of course, we would love to hear from people here who, um, who, who may fit that mold. And we would love to grab as many material engineers as possible, right? <laughs> I think if we could attract those to Core Tech, we would be tickled to death. But, I, you know, we also look for, you know, process engineers to help drive efficiencies in our operations. But we're a material company, and material engineers are uh, where we have a heavy demand. So I'll, I'll actually put in a plug for Acers here. We had a, a breakfast meeting this morning. Uh, Acers definitely has heard the industry say that there's not enough people and is actively working towards bringing more people in with um, ceramic kits for educators to running online educational programs, et cetera. So I, I see there's one or two people from Acers who are here in the back. So I certainly look to your Acers booth if you want to talk to anybody about how to get involved and, and, and support that function. We definitely need, the, as an industry, we need more people. You know, we need more people with material science and ceramics backgrounds. We need more workers who can support our factories for sure. And how to get that message out is something I think we're all struggling with. So we had, uh, just as a, another question, someone asked, um, are there elements of supply chain in which recycled material is increasingly important? I missed the last part, recycling. Are there elements of supply chain in which recycled materials are increasingly important? I mean, we've always done it for precious metal related products that, you know, you get some that goes in the waste stream. Uh, you know, in uh, tungsten materials, we're now doing that more than uh, we ever have. Uh, but those are the only ones that really uh, jump out at me. Uh, tungsten, for those who don't know, I mean, there's a pretty dramatic uh, supply chain shortage at the moment. I mean, I'll, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, it, I mean, it's always important for us to look at, um, you know, non-virgin material. But I think also, and we do it already, but I think it's, also highly important on the purity of our materials that we sell to our end product, our end customers as well. So it's that balance. But if, if we can find something that is comparable and does a form fit and function and meets our specifications, we're interested in looking at it, but it has to meet our, those requirements um, as well. Yeah, I mean, I would say for Kiyosara, there's less of a focus on recycled materials and more of a focus on being a green company overall. I think it's important for all our, our corporations, we want to try to be green and help the environment. There's a lot of focus on that. I think that a lot of uh, uh, our populations care a lot about being a green company and doing the right thing. And so we're certainly increasing our efforts to making the company as green as possible, carbon neutral, et cetera. Yeah. You, where, you guys, where it's appropriate. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Where appropriate. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay, great questions from the audience. Keep them coming, please. So um, other topics that we'd like to talk about, you think that's appropriate here? Um, looking for ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only thing I would bring up, yeah, I think, Mark, when we talked about the challenges of the pandemic, you know, I, I wrote down four things, and I think we talked about a few of them, but, you know, demand planning from our perspective was core. Inventory management was definitely core uh, to us and heavy focus. And then sourcing, uh, sourcing strategies that we talked about. But I think from my four years at Course Tech on the other side, from a commercial side, the connectiveness between supply chain and commercial was a, maybe a, a, a gap that we started closing because of the pandemic uh, was a key driver. We needed to make sure we were better connected on the front of demand planning and forecasting. And also around the, what I talked about earlier around the setting of expectations, both internally from my perspective down into the supply chain as well as with the customers. But I think also the, the other piece that's there is uh, as we hit the inflationary markets, working heavily with commercial uh, strategies and how uh, a company like Corstech cannot absorb those cost increases that are coming fast and furious and how we can work with commercial on the other side of the, of the coin, right? I think that was a key area as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it, from, from our end, uh, and, and I mentioned it uh, while we were sitting in back, uh, it, we attempted to get our head, 
heads around hedging. You know, we're a small to medium sized enterprise, so not the same scale and scope as uh, uh, Coors Tech and uh, uh, Kyocera. But we tried to hedge uh, commodity prices and really could not get our heads around it. Uh, so I would put that in the didn't work out ca uh, column, but we're going to crack the code sure. uh, and get there. And uh, we also had uh, played this game of uh, buying advanced slots for shipping and then trying to time inventory getting to it. Really just, I don't think we were sophisticated enough to know how to do that and do that well. But uh, I, I think the big takeaway, um, setting aside the pandemic at this point, is uh, a crisis management planning in general. One of the things that we did as an organization is uh, after the dust settled, we said, you know what? Like every business, there are risks um, all throughout our operations. So let's take an inventory of them. Let's rack and stack them in terms of materiality and, and potential likelihood, and then really develop crisis management plans so that, again, you're not thinking when it's time uh, to act. And I actually, I picked up this skill uh, in another business doing M&A in uh, consumer entertainment where, you know, you put on a live event, there are dozens of scenarios where things can go wrong. And so we did that very proactively in that business. I think we need to do more of that. And I would encourage other people in industry hmm. also to do that. Uh, especially, I know you guys would do it, but a small to medium enterprise, they don't do enough of it. I don't know. I, I think going back to like Chris's previous comment, like you really need to go a lot more into demand planning. Uh, I don't know if you guys see it right now, but it's it's uh, for some supply chain products. What we're seeing is you know really working with your customers because if the customer tells you, oh, like you don't have the material, here, here's three more orders. <laughs> and well, just because you add three, five, ten more orders doesn't mean that the material is going to get here faster. <laughs> you know, uh, so kind of like really plan out your forecasts out better with the customers. Yeah, I think. Uh... I think the headliner for me there is mix matters, right? And I think between commercial and then our factory and the shop floor, understanding that demand at a mixed yeah. level and trickling that down. You know, one of the things that, that kind of bothered me is I, I felt like there was not a good enough understanding or acknowledgement from our customers. So, we, I, I, you know, I, so I put the customers in two camps. One is... Uh, their industry was in trouble and they battened down the hatches and they basically said every supplier fend for themselves, you're on your own. Uh, and then the other customers were, we're booming, get your capacity up or I'm going to find it from somebody else. Uh, and I think it's really unfair. Our industry is extremely capital intensive. There's a lot of manual labor. There's a lot of things that require us to be very, very long-term planners. And when, an, when our customers basically say, you're on your own, you figure it out, was very, very difficult for us. And so I was trying to educate our customers in this situation, but, but we didn't find a lot of sympathy. You guys have any similar experiences? Our customers were understanding on uh, delays, but they just wanted the brass tacks, right? Okay, you're telling me there's a delay. Inside, outside, what does it look like so I can plan for it? Uh, because we're in nanomaterials and uh, we're the largest in our space and, you know, as you go kind of down the, the industry, it gets small pretty quick. Uh, there weren't a lot of other places to go, so perhaps that was part of what was driving it. But it, definitely customers just want to get down to brass tacks, get me my material. If you can't get it to me, when are you going to deliver? And then really, really do it. All right. I think like 90% of our customers understood the, uh, the business and uh, the, the delays as long as we gave them um, accurate as, as, as accurate as you can give them, ETAs of material. Um, and then the other 10% you know, were basically just, uh, we're probably the only additive that they source overseas. Um, so they don't really see that, uh, they're, they're, they equate like ocean freight issues more with uh, trucking, which is, yes, there's still issues on both sides, but ocean freight has gone up, you know, five, 10 X, you know, so. And I think it depends on the end market, right? I think. Certain end markets were more sophisticated and you know, they have heavy demand, but their expectations and their ability to forecast and provide that forecast is greater than some other end markets. That's uh, less capable of forecasting, which then is problematic when they have a spend for ourselves and then jump when we receive an order. Right? It's very difficult to throw that into the mix and capacity planning of our plants. And so those are difficult, those are, those are definitely difficulties for us to handle and that's why I think 
you know, the general topic of demand forecasting and the mix matters and getting down to even extrapolating and projecting better ourselves, even for those unknowns where maybe 60, 70 percent of our business is more known and the other 40, 30 percent is unknown. We have to plan for that unknown because those are painful, right? Yeah. I mean, we see these huge ramp up, ramp downs. It's very tough to address. Yeah, very tough right. to address. All right, we have another um, a question from the audience. Um, what kind of changes or requirements from our, your customers have you seen flow down to your suppliers due to COVID? <laughs> You've seen any? Not really? I don't, I don't know if I've seen much flow down from our customers. I think we set our own yeah. um, protocols ourselves. I think we were ahead of the game. And I, I think we did some great things. Uh, that we didn't require any flow down from our customers. We, I think we're relatively on top of it, protected our employees, kept our factories running and supported their, their demand the way that we could. I mean, I, I remember seeing early on, they were asking us how are we gonna guarantee business continuity? Well, that, I mean, we had customers ask us, were you keeping your people safe? Because if they're not safe, they can't work on our stuff. Yeah. We saw those kinds of things. Other than that, I don't really see any other flow downs either. Yeah, it was mostly just a, just a question. Can you guys keep running? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. precisely uh, the, the same situation yeah. with us. We didn't really see anything flow down. And I think really between all the, our organizations, we were proactive. Yeah. You know, if, if things were sloppy, maybe you would start to see flow down requirements. Oh, yeah. so, so let's move to kind of a, a positive side. I mean, uh, I think, you know, one of the questions is, is there a silver lining to COVID? Have you guys, you know, where you feel comfortable talking about it, are there any newer opportunities that became, came to light as a result of the COVID and the situation? Any things that as an industry should be really good for us? I mean, personally, I feel uh, very good about the ceramics industry right now, materials in general, and uh, especially, you know, I think there's things, manufacturing moving back to the U.S. and should be very positive for the industry. You guys like to comment on, on that topic at all? Yeah, I think there's, <laughs> there's definitely silver linings, right? I think just in, inside kind of focused. I think our teams are collaborating way better coming out of the pandemic than we were heading into the pandemic. We're tighter and it gets back to the communication, communication, communication aspect. Right. And I think that also trickled externally, right? We're, we have better, stronger communications, both with our customers as well as with our suppliers and what we had in the past. And it was mainly because we were firefighting throughout the pandemic. And I hope that communication continues as we go forward uh, out, coming out of the pandemic, right? And uh, so I think that was a silver lining, definitely. Yeah, it definitely was a silver lining for us. Even like our internal communications have gone up uh, tremendously. Um, and we're actually, uh, not, like like I said, firefighting. Every problem now everyone knows in the industry and our organization and how they can help out. And people have ideas to kind of uh, build going forward. Yeah, I mean, it, it, from my end, obviously, collaboration, communications, I think that that rose up and it, it stayed there. Uh, one really interesting byproduct of, of the, uh, the pandemic, and I still don't understand 100% how, how it occurred, is we, we support a lot of companies that are still at the applied research stage. So they need small amounts of materials and ever increasing amounts as they go to prototype qualification and then we eventually manufacture. Um, once we got out of the thick of the beginning of the pandemic, that side of our business just absolutely exploded in ways that we never anticipated, which was uh, a silver lining. And then probably the ultimate silver lining is thank you, federal funds uh, rate for going down to zero because, you know, <laughs> you were able to finance, you know, infrastructure capacity expansion uh, at, at really cheap costs. Well, I, I mean, one of the things that we've seen, I would think you guys have seen the same thing is that you know, previously, I wouldn't say that the medical world was such a huge industry for us. I mean, they've really had lots of other material opportunities that they were using. But um, we saw over the last two years has been a tremendous interest in a, a multitude of medical applications for ceramic materials. So to me, that's one of the big silver linings is, you know, industries like the medical world who are finding better use of ceramics, find that there's value added there and starting to come to us and talk about opportunities. Anything like that you guys are seeing or want to talk about? Or? I wouldn't say that not on the medical device side, but for us, we're, we're majority industrial, but we're coming, we're getting more and more projects from customers uh, because you help them out with um, certain projects, certain products that we've normally never handled before. 
Um, and now we're getting more opportunities to do supplier diversification for them where they were single sourced and then start working on some things out for them like that. Yeah, so there has definitely been a surge in certain industries. Unfortunately for us, we support companies at the stealth level, so we're completely bound to not talk about any of it. But there were certainly, I would say, breakout stars um, after the pandemic. I, I can think of two, maybe three sectors uh, right off the top of my head. Gotcha. All right, we have about three minutes left of this session, so if there's any last questions, people like to send me through Slido. We're trying to address all of them. We'd happy to, to do that. Why don't we start thinking about um, uh, winding down? Any kind of last thoughts you'd like to leave your audience uh, on the whole topic or anything in general? I, I would just say, I mean, it was a, a, a trying time. I think uh, business was pretty resilient uh, across the board in, in this industry and others, uh, which really was amazing, you know, the can-do attitude of, of people during uh, a crisis period. Uh, I would harp on it again just because we saw so much value uh, out of it is the crisis management planning, especially for uh, those companies that are small, medium enterprises. And uh, otherwise, I think the only thing that uh, you need to be thinking now about now for the future is kind of, you know, where is the economy taking us? What is the midterm forecast for the macro economy, the five year, the 10 year look like? Uh, and it's a little cloudy to me. I've been trying to study this for, for the last year, but I think it's worth people paying attention to? I would just say, uh, you know, at, at this conference, we have a lot of uh, key supplier partnerships here. Mm -hmm. I would just say a big thank you to those that really have helped us kind of survive throughout the pandemic and the issues and challenges that we've had. So thank you for that support. But I also would say that, you know, we have a lot of work to do together going forward and a lot of challenges and new expectations to meet so hopefully uh, our supply partners are up to the challenge and can help us meet that heading into the remainder of this year and into 2022. Same thing, really, is just really thanking everybody. Um, and like I said, we're not through it yet, and we're kind of trying to see what we can do and keep building. Um, what I would say also is, you know, when you're looking at your supply diversification, you know, really, um, products that you know you typically would have said brought in directly, you know pay the few extra cents or more than a few dollars, get, get the uh, inventory in and make sure that you have supply going forward. Great, so clear communication internally and externally, very important, forecasting very important for our industry. I'd like to um, uh, thank our speakers and, and thank you for the session. I'd like to uh, thank the audience for attending um, and remind you there's a short break before our next session at 10.55 where the panel discussion is towards sustainability, facilitating environmentally friendly practices whilst maintaining optimum productivity in the ceramics industry. Thank you all, have a good show. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Thank you.